Hi, I'm Ward Bryan, owner of the Mountain Shooting Center. And today I have a little bit of a treat for you. There are some historical people in the firearms industry that don't have the same visibility that they used to have. And today I'm going to introduce you to Mark Chanlin of Rocky Mountain Rifle Works, who uh, not only is a rifle maker, but a barrel maker and one that's pretty doggone good at it and has been doing it for over 50 years. I believe 50 years. So, come on. Let's go meet Mark. So here I am with uh, Mark Chanlin of Rocky Mountain Rifle Works. And Mark, you've been making rifle barrels for quite a while, haven't you? Yes, I have. How long? Uh, on my own since 1982, but mm -hmm. I apprenticed with Overmeyer um, and did some work before that uh, in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. way back in the 60s, shortly after I got out of school in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. So you went to school in Trinidad, Colorado? I did. That's interesting. And then you apprenticed with Boots Overmeyer? Yes. And so there's different ways to make barrels. Um, one of them is like a, a gang brooch cutter. One of them is to pull a button through the barrel. Um, there's other ways, obviously, but how do you cut I, your I single point cut, yes. And that means if you pull a cutter through the barrel, one groove at a time. Yep. And why do you think the uh, single point cut barrels are the best barrels you can make? Well, there's some definite advantages to it. A big one is all the external contouring is done prior to any finished dimension being put inside the barrel. Um, steel is not unlike wood as it's machined, it changes dimensions and moves. Um, you can take all of that out of there before I ream and rifle, which is an advantage. Um, good rifle barrels are all about uniformity. Uh, that's what you're striving for, uniformity in diameter um, on the on your lands or your, your ream bore, uniformity in your grooves, uniformity in your rotation. This Y and that 33 broke in in about 15, 10 to 15 rounds. It has to do with finish. The finish. Yep. And the in, internal dimensions of that barrel? Not the dimensions as, as much as finish when it comes to break in. Oh, I see. Because that first bullet that I put through that other barrel, it took me 24 hours to clean out the cock, remember? Yeah. And it was really something. Well, hey, why don't you give us a tour and show us? You know, I just want to say that in comparison, um, you know, I was once in the Israeli military industries factory, which is now IWI, and saw that they manufacture their barrels by cold hammer forging, and they have these yeah. machines. With the, you know, they take a pipe, drill a hole through it, it's about this big, but it goes through the machine. All based on production. Yeah. Not based on high quality, would you say? No, but production. Okay. They're, they're trying to make a lot of units in a short period of time. That doesn't happen here. Okay. <laughs> this is old school. Well, show us around, will you? Okay. Okay, here's the, a barrel blank. This is cut out of a 17 foot length of this. It's inch and five sixteenths, it's four sixteen, gun barrel quality stainless. It is manufactured in the United States. Um, it's quite expensive, but it's, it's worth buying in the United States. I've tried material that's been sent to me from all over the world, uh, and none of it compares to this. So it's worth paying the money, and it's worth buying it made in America. And what's your next step once you have that pipe? Well, and what I'll do is I'll square the ends, I'll turn the end to a, a diameter that fits all my um, different fixtures and things, and then it goes into a, a tracing machine and I cut the outside shape. So we can show you that. Okay. So this is a hydraulic tracing machine, tracing lathe. Um, your material fits up on top. This is a, a pattern that this stylus follows and whatever pattern you have in here, it will duplicate it on top. Uh, I'll rough these things to approximately 100 thousandths over their finished diameter in, in the first roughing process. This, the machine over here, 
is basically the same thing, does the same thing, just a different manufacturer of the machine. These are barns, single spindle variable speed drills. I've got two of them sitting here back to back. This is what drills the initial hole. Uh, your drill is stationary. The barrel rotates. This entire top of this machine is hydraulically fed over the drill. You're pumping oil through the drill, which exits when it's in the barrel. There's, there's a V-cut in the bottom of the drill that blows the chip back out the hole. So it's, it's constantly clearing chips as it's drilling. Um, these drills were made for this purpose, to drill gun barrels. How old is this machine? Both of these machines are World War II machines. Nice. W.F. and John Barnes. All right. And the next point of the process is? Then I'll go back and put it in the tracer and I'll take that last hundred thousandths off of it to make sure that everything is concentric inside and out. And from there it goes on to a bore reamer. And that's up over here. Okay, this is a deep ball reaming machine. This is a homemade machine I put together. Uh, it was originally a horizontal boring machine. So here, your barrel is, fits in, into the carriage and is stationary. Your, your reamer rotates, and this carriage is fed over the reamer. There's, once again, oil pumped through the reamer to carry the swarf out of the bore. This becomes the top of the land when this step is finished. So this is important to have a high quality finish and uniformity in diameter from one end to the other. And how many of these machines do you have? Uh, this one and the one that you're standing next to is another homemade reaming machine um, from a lathe, from an engine lathe, and converted to, to do the same process and the hydraulic oil system built into it. Okay. All right. And now from this station, where do you go? Well, then it, I do some hand lapping. Um, to improve the finish on the bore a little bit, make sure that there's no variation in it. Uh, so I'll hand lap that bore before I rifle it. And then it goes on to, this machine is a Pratt & Whitney hydraulic rifling machine. And this is where all the rifling is done. This one, the next one is a Pratt & Whitney sign bar rifling machine. They both do the same thing with the same type of tooling. Uh, the difference is, this machine picks its rotation up off of the leader bars and the gear ratios that I've converted on here and the sign bar picks the rotation up by the angle of the sign bar. So this is set to the gears, the sign bar is infinite, you can cut any kind of rate of twist with that. And I'll sometimes get requests to do unusual, strange, odd numbered twists and things, I can do it on the sign bar. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the tooling I've made so it's all interchangeable between the two machines. Thank you so much for taking your time to, to explain this to us and to show people how barrels are made and, and all. Well, so, you're welcome, Ward. There, I might add there's still more lapping after the, the rifling process. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a fair amount of handwork goes into this. You know, let me ask you, you, you know, this is Rocky Mountain Rifle Works. And you have built for me AR-10s, you know, 308 ARs that are, shoot pretty much every, good, every bit as good as a bolt gun shoots. Well, the AR is a good system um, for accuracy. I started converting ARs in 1975 into um, high power match rifles for national match course, that kind of thing. Uh, I actually started converting AR-10s way back then when they came into the country from Canada. Hmm. And, and the Canadians got them out of Rhodesia, the very first ones. And it's, it's basically the same system. It's a very accurate system if you build these things correctly because it does not have operats and gas pistons like most semi-automatic weapons do. Um, so it lends itself to accuracy if they're put together right and they will shoot like a good bolt gun. The one that you built me, you, you know, we were, I was experimenting with the twist rate and I went to that one and eight twist barrel. And that thing shoots lights out. It shoots about one eighth minute of angle at 100 meters. 
Well, once again, that's what they're supposed to do. Yeah. That's why we go through all this. All right. Anything else you can tell me? I, this is a, a trade that um, most of it's in the tooling. So how precise your tooling is, is critical. You ha I have to make all my own tooling. I can't buy any of it. Um, it's, it's just part of the industry. Uh, things I learned from Obermeyer. I was very fortunate to have gone to school in Trinidad with really excellent instructors down there. Um, Bill Prater and Ed Shulin and Red Key, they were wonderful. Taught me a lot. And then even more fortunate to, to go to work with Obermeyer after I got out of there, uh, who just had a world of knowledge in this. And the people you used to shoot with, tell me a little bit about that. Well, I shot competitive high power rifle all my life. National match course, long range, Palma. Um, shot with a lot of good shooters. Takes good equipment to do that. If you want to compete at the high level of that, it takes good equipment. Well, thank you again. Thank you, Ward. It's great to do this.